market walk. We are at this fabulous Nika store here on Linking Road in Mumbai. Nika is your one-stop shop for all your beauty needs. So from the international and the luxurious, from the branded to the homegrown and affordable, you find it all at Nika. At the helm of it is Falguni Nair and I am a alumni, former MD of Kotak Mahindra Capital and I am your host Reema Tendulkar from CNBC TV 18. crore of revenues, 5,000 crore of valuation. Did you see Nika this big when you started off seven years ago? Um, not really. I really uh, was hoping, I used to joke that if I'm performing a ballet, I know I'm not in New York, but let me be in <laughs> Mumbai at least and not in Timbuktu. So I'm happy that uh, we have been able to build beauty as a category where the business has got built up very strongly over the last few years. I think all our business partners tell us that we've grown the category beyond you know, people thought India was not. So, a big what was your for own beauty. projection for Nika? No, I never had projection at that stage. Well, you're a finance I, professional. <laughs> you're the queen of Excel. I, um, you would have been. I used to joke that I don't have a business plan, and I truly did not have a business plan when I jumped in. And um, my friends who know me used to say, "Don't say that," because uh, knowing your believe. discipline in uh, numbers, we know that you have the entire business plan in your mind. So maybe it was in my mind, but uh, so what clearly, was in your uh, mind? Uh, in my mind, I started from first principles. I saw what was needed to sell beauty. I was very convinced that we need to do education for consumers to embrace beauty. They need to be educated a little bit on the subject. And uh, I think we focused a lot on education. We also believed that the products needed to be genuine, authentic. This is beauty is a category where products are um, registered in India. I mean, we come under FDA rules and as a result, uh, Food and Drug Administration. So we have to, all our products are registered in India, even the ones we sell from imported brands, they need to be registered. So we knew that we wanted to follow all the rules, we wanted to take the inventory bet, we wanted to make sure the products were genuine, sourced from the right source, and uh, you know, fresh products give to the customer. So we focused a lot on building the basics. And and why did um, you select beauty as a category to start with in the first place? What was um, the opportunity you saw there? Market gap. I saw that beauty was big business in uh, both US, in Korea, in Japan and I saw that it was not a big business in India. I knew that there were certain adversities like basically if you look at um, the ground floor of all the big, uh, uh, big uh, department stores like Harrods or in the US like you know Saks Fifth, Fifth Avenue, the ground floor is always fo filled with beauty products and I never saw that enough in India and I just recognized a market gap and I wanted to solve for it. You said your uh, industry partners have said that Nika has helped to grow the industry per se. So how big is the beauty in the wellness market? And in the last seven years, how fast has it grown? Uh, see, beauty is a very exciting category at the moment. World over in developed markets also, it is growing in high teens, which okay. is very rare in developed markets for yeah, any category to be going, growing at high Considering teens. Considering the GDP is what, two, three yes. percent? So yes. Yes. And I believe in India, we, we at Nika are growing at 100% year on year. For last couple of years, on a high base, we've been delivering that kind of very fast-paced growth. And I think overall also category is growing at very fast pace, I would say 30-40%. See, we are experiencing a lot more growth uh, in e-commerce, because e-commerce had a share to take from physical retail. Uh, but overall, the category itself is growing very fast. I'll come to that bit on the Omni channel. Uh, because you've decided to set up physical retail uh, stores as well. But let me come to the company's financials since we spoke about it. It's already 1,200 crore of revenues. You've been growing at 100% year on year up until now. Can you sustain that? So last year, um, we had planned that we'll grow from 570 crores to 1,050. And at the end of the year, we discovered that we ended the year at 1,200. So much ahead of our projection. So we continue to say that uh, we will not grow as fast. So our projection this year is 80% growth, which itself is quite aggressive. Absolutely. So 80% this year, what about five years down the line? Um, now do you have a business plan? Now do you have an Excel in place? But uh, everyone who knows me, from my investors to my uh, you know, team members, they all know that I'm a very now person. Okay. So what matters to me is next year. 
and one year at a time. One year at a time. Okay, what about at the EBITDA level? You've broken even, uh, right? Yeah, we are uh, EBITDA positive. But, uh, you know, for to be truly sustainable business, I, knew, I know that we need to build our EBITDA. So the plan is going to be building profitability over the next one or two years. So hopefully we'll get to first 5 6% EBITDA and then over time 10 So 12%. right now, what is the EBITDA? It just break even. <laughs> oh, it's just break even. How important is a private label for the company to be profitable? Uh, I personally felt like we have 1,000 brands on the website. Okay. So with 1,000 brands, and I chose beauty as a category which is more of a... Uh, basically, I, I chose to be a multi-brand retailer in beauty because I think there's a fragmentation of the market. It's a very... Um, there's, so, there's so much competition. And there's no brand in the U.S. also which will have even 1% or 2% share. India was a little different. We had Lakme, which had a dominant share. Maybelline now has some. But internationally, that's not the case. There's just lots and lots of brands. And that's where the power of a retailer comes from. So I clearly chose a category where I felt that there was a lot of market fragmentation. And as a result, I never thought private label was a big strategy. Okay. But to our surprise, when, I, when we launched our private label brand, because Nike had so much goodwill of the customer, that our brand was accepted very um, rapidly and we saw that our brand became a customer favorite pretty soon. So I realized, and this was a lesson I learned, that when the customer trusts you as a retailer, they also trust you as, a, you know, as someone who gives them products. You know? And our brand was trusted and as a result, we've really achieved very good, good penetration. Which is why you've now ventured into fashion as well. But on that, in a bit, so right now, private label is what percentage of Lanka's revenue and is there any projection that you have in mind? Uh, we have gone on record saying that at the moment, uh, private label is a single digit and the plan is to take it up to about 20%. But that's not one brand, it's a whole bunch of brands from, it's like we are going to be a house of brands with a number of brands uh, coming from our stable. What's the difference in margins on your Nike products versus what you get on other products? See, I don't look at it that way. I just uh, feel that as a retailer, we get same margin whether we sell Nike or we sell any other brand. And similarly, as a manufacturer, we have a similar profitability structure as any other brand because you need to have some profitability with the brand mm -hmm. to afford marketing, to afford research and development, to afford new, you know, continuing to build the brand. So I think uh, I keep hearing this in e-commerce that, oh, your own brands give you better margins and hence you push them. I don't look at it like that. For me, there are two different buckets of business and each of the businesses have their own cost structures very much in line with the industry standard. Okay. So it's not that you're making higher margins? Not or? as a retailer. Not as a retailer. You recently raised about 100 crores from TPG. That's given you the growth capital that you need. What are the plans on utilizing it? What does your store count increase from the current 39 stores, I think? Yeah, we are at 39 stores. And the plan is to take that up to another 30, 40 stores this year. And then we'll continue the journey. We have gone on record saying we'll be at about 180 stores in the next couple of years. So we have our site on about 180 stores at the moment. And uh, yes, store is some investment. Most of our investment goes in building our warehouse capacity. We will automate it and go for more, you know, maybe robotics in our warehouse. So, you know, there'll be a fair amount of investment in our warehouse capacity. There'll be a fair amount of investment in our stores and um, some amount of investment in brand building. This whole omni-channel strategy is very interesting. Uh, I understand it's the new buzzword in retail and the concept is sound. You're giving a seamless uh, experience to your customers. They can touch and feel your product. But at a time when we're talking about or we're talking, you know, the singing the death knell for brick and mortar stores, here is an online company and not just you, a couple of the others making that incremental investment to own a physical store. Yeah. Um, how do the economics of it work? So firstly, we came into physical world because our clients wanted us there. We soon realized as we started talking about few stores, we started realizing that the clients wanted us to set up more stores and uh, they were very excited we, when we went to their city and put up stores like you must be seeing our social media when we put up a post saying we're coming to the city everybody's like yeah and then others like why aren't you coming to this city that city and that tells us where to go next so I think our clients clearly wanted us what we realized was that while a lot of our e-commerce customers uh, are truly omni-channel, like 70% of them buy online or as well as offline. So while they're happy to buy online most of the time, once in a while they want to come into the store to learn something more, to experience something, to touch and feel something, so the store has its place. Another thing is in the today's digital world, the, the historically the stores have had um, 
disadvantages. So some of the disadvantages were like, we have 1,000 brands on the website. In the store, we can't carry more than 80. So now people like us have endless aisle where customer can come in, discuss something, and they can place order on any of our other products. The second thing is that we also can drive customers to our stores through social media, telling them about the offers, telling them about what is new in the store, yeah. what are the events in the store. So it's a very digitally connected store and that probably has a place today somewhere. But will it slow down your path to uh, profitability, these investments? Um, I have to admit that the physical retail has more expenses and harder to get to EBITDA positive. Uh, but I think it's very much as a mix. I think it's very critical to our strategy and our success. What about warehousing? How many more warehouses will you open? We have six warehouses now and uh, we will definitely double our warehouse capacity. Uh, so there will be another five, six more warehouses. You've been talking about your growth projection, store expansion, warehouse expansion. What about an IPO? Uh, definitely, I think um, to me, IPO is like um, you know coming of age for Nika. Like Nika is then ready to have a long-term life of its own and its dependence on any one investor group goes down. So I think IPO is a clear path for Nika. I just feel the company should be stronger. So we will wait for a year or two, and when we feel we are really strong to be in the public markets, so that's when we do it. Define idea. stronger. The stronger means uh, there's a more sustainable profitability. So you'll want to see one or two years of the company at least having mid-single digit kind of? On the subject of uh, profitability, Falcony, the recent Uber listing has disappointed people. Uh, is there a lot of focus now on profitability of e-commerce companies as you go out and try and raise money from the PEVC market? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, but you know, I've been through as an investment banker and a stockbroker for many years. I've been through these cycles where there are times when customers are all very excited about. I remember you must have you must have been a young girl or maybe not born then. But uh, during the tech bubble, you know, they would talk about how many eyeballs a particular site got. And then that didn't matter. And what finally matters is long-term profitability. So at, for me, I have always built Nikon on very solid financial fundamentals with a lot of emphasis on profitability, like the economics, like the unit economics mm -hmm. and the profitability f per transaction. Okay. And also in the long run, uh, I also per personally feel that one has to look at every business from a return on capital perspective. That is what makes a great stock market story and Absolutely. nothing else. <laughs> so what is the return on capital for Nika now? Or what is it, what's Nika your aspiration? Nika has been very capital efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, till you have a negative return, it's difficult to calculate return on capital. Yeah. But um, I think we've come so far and built such a big business with investment which was as little as 200, 250 crores till now. And that includes all our working capital needs and everything. What was your uh, capital when you started out? Would you put on your own? It was very low. It was a couple of million dollars. You had to do something differently with the wisdom of hindsight. What would it be? Um, I just, I've said this before. When I started out, I, I was confident of myself as a, as a manager, so to speak. But I didn't know that I didn't know technology enough. I did not know, I mean, at that point, I didn't know beauty. I didn't know retailing. I didn't know technology. I didn't know many things. But I do feel on hindsight that if I had a co-founder who was from the field of technology, that would give a lot of strength. But now, of course, we've really built a very strong technology team. Yeah. Today, I see Nike as a more technology company than really a retailer. We are a, rather than being a tech-enabled retailer, we are a tech company that is into retail. retailing. Yeah, into retail. Mm -hmm. So I'm really proud of where we've come now. You spoke about robots in your warehouses. Uh, not yet. Not yet, but you plan to. Plan to. Uh, how do you plan to use technology to reshape the business from here on, since you are a tech company now? See, our dream would be that when we get our products inverted, we invert them in a way that when our orders, they're basically inverted, keeping in mind the mix with which the orders are going to come. Mm -hmm. So that our whole process of dispatch continues to be very strong. So at the moment we dispatch almost 40% of our orders within four hours and another 80-85% within eight hours mm -hmm. and we are trying to improve those parameters and that needs very different type of warehouse management. You've been dubbed as a Sephora of India and you've always said and you've said this on record for you Sephora stands for the ultimate multi-experience retail company. Uh, you know, what's the gap between Nika and Sephora right now? I don't know. I, um, I only uh, experience Sephora in India, otherwise I read about them. 
so i don't think there's too much gap what i do understand now is that uh, retail both in china and india is really moving far ahead of where i mean retail in us has been very developed and we are inspired and motivated by what they do and uh, most of their success comes from art of retailing but today technology led retail is literally very moving forward both in uh, both in china and india at such a fast pace that the west is looking at Indi india and china is an overseas store an aspiration of nike or you I'm very excited by Indian consumers, so I don't see the need to go abroad. Uh, you can see that with our extensions. We are very much focusing on our Indian consumers and want to do more. So we have a new website called Nike Man that uh, we have yeah. recently launched because we we always had the products they want, but our site was so so inclined towards selling to women that we needed a separate dedicated website for men. So we have that now. We are also extending to fashion, which is where we have a new website. We believe fashion is a different way of selling, and hence there's a whole new business being laid out. I mean, some of Nike's uh, playbook and some new things that we have to learn given the needs. But of beauty fashion. was an underpenetrated market in India, very fragmented. Uh, fashion is not. Fashion is very well penetrated, at least on you know in the online sphere. Yeah, I feel that uh, as a promoter or as an entrepreneur, you see gaps that others don't see. So, so what's the gap me, in fashion? Like, I think the pre. Like I think most of the fashion online is built on price. We we are not excited by that. We are excited by more style. We are more excited by higher quality, better quality. Of course, value for money, but better quality mm -hmm. than what is available. And something that you get get excited about. And we already know that what we with what we are offering on our site, already those early adapters are getting very excited. They are telling us that what you are offering is superb. The online world is dominated by heavy discounting. Uh, that's not a route that you've used, at least for the beauty products in Nike. But will you veer towards that for your fashion segment? Our view is that the fashion has been spoiled in the past by too much discounting. Absolutely. And the consumer is not looking for the most discounted product. They are looking for. I thought they do look for the most discounted product. No, I think if something is. Look, you don't want to pay more when the same thing is available at a cheaper price. So, you know, that motto of never knowingly undersold or oversold or overcharged, that's not what I'm talking about. But if you get something unique and something better at a better price, maybe you'll choose that. So we'll see. I think we definitely want to build, we'll, we want to build the category in a way the customer gets excited about it and is happy. So that will come, this high quality product, uh, high quality uh, fashion apparel will come from Nike's own uh, brand? There are enough for, it will be multi-brand format. We already have more than 300 brands But all those website. brands are there on other platforms as well, right? Not always. Not and always. And they're not discovered. What we do understand is that the discoverability is a big issue. So how do you help customers discover what they're going to like? Falcony, I have to ask you this. How worried are you about the consumption slowdown in the industry? A lot of FMCG companies have reported and the likes of Dabur, Godrej Consumer, Page, they're all reporting low single-digit kind of growth numbers. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm on lot of boards of a lot of companies and as you follow the results, it's definitely uh, been a surprising quarter. So everyone is being hopeful that it's a temporary phenomenon and the market will pick up uh, because the underlying fundamentals seem to be in place. And uh, for someone like Nike also, which who's growing at 100% year on year, uh, we have to say that since November, we have seen a little slowdown. And we are also keeping our fingers crossed for what uh, would you attribute the slowdown to? Season. So we grew very strongly between September and November. We grew by 60% in just two months. So obviously after that we found it hard to maintain the November numbers and uh, continue to grow from there. And May is the first month where we saw the pickup. May is also considered uh, off season, so to speak, for beauty. So real season begins in September. A quick rapid fire then with the beauty queen of India, Falguni Nair of Nike. Falguni, the person who's influenced you the most? I have to say brand Chanel and Coco Chanel herself. More I read about her, more I went and I even went and saw her life, how she lived, uh, you know, her uh, her apartment in uh, Paris and how she influenced uh, the dressing sense of women of those ages, how she gave them confidence. And I think all of that I find it very excited. I mean, very um, exciting, yeah. Your husband's not your influencer? Um, in many ways he is. He has uh, made me what I call as from a happy-go-lucky girl who would just waste her time sitting in a field of flowers to what I am today. So yes, he has uh, So what's the best advice that you got from Sanjay Nair? 
Um, I think he's a big, uh, he's a very disciplined person, very hardworking, and uh, I think just commitment to work is the best advice I get from him. What's the best advice that you've given your kids? I think to my kids, I keep telling them, I tell everybody that life and especially entrepreneurship is like a roller coaster life, roller coaster. So do not get down by the downs. Have you know, have strength to face them, and also do not get over uh, hyped with your so, successes. Yeah. So absolutely. what's the advice you tell yourself when you fail? I don't see any failures. I just see them as uh, need to do more work. So I really feel that I'm not the type of person who gets set back or sees a setback as a setback. So you don't get disappointed? I, get, I don't get disappointed. There's a I sad just, day in Falcony's life? Yeah, to me, like even my team will come and say, oh, this month we didn't meet the budget. I just say, you must have got the budget wrong. So don't worry. <laughs> Long term is good. <laughs> well, I think I should tell my boss that. Is any your Eureka moment? Definitely when I discovered the brand name Nika, a friend of mine helped me with it and I'm so excited with the word and the name and it truly really was our Eureka moment. As a Kotak Mahendra banker, the entrepreneur you respected the most? I definitely learned a lot from Uday and I really respected him because of the courage he gives people to do the right thing. He tells his team to do the right thing and yet achieve and perform and I think that was a big lesson. A skill set the next generation needs. One thing I do say that both uh, young boys and girls should learn to code. So you, you don't need to learn the third or fourth language, you need to learn how to code? How to code. How do you do it all? Um, I just don't, I just don't see any constraints. I just do what I feel like I enjoy. I take my holidays, I enjoy my weekends, I, I love my work, I spend a lot of time with family. So fortunately, you know, it's So how many hours do you work in a day? How do you achieve a 5,000 crore company if you have time to holiday, spend time at home? See, I think everyone who knows me knows that I'm happiest when I can get out of work at, sun, uh, at 6 before sunset. So I really feel I'm not a workaholic, but I do commit myself. So I have passion for work and I do what it takes. And, and do you really leave at 6 p.m.? And what do you define a workaholic? How do you define a workaholic? I feel that you cannot leave every day at 6 because the work does need you longer. So I we used to say juggle, you know. So some days I leave at 6 and then some days if I'm required to work till 9, 10, 3 a.m., I'll do that. I'll do that. And today? What day is today? I never know in the morning. It all depends on how the day goes and how much I achieve uh, in the day. And if it drags, it drags. Nika, five years down the line? Um, Nika, five years down the line will definitely be a very strong company. Uh, straddling both fashion and beauty and maybe a listed company with revenues definitely listed off. company I think I don't know but uh, if the growth path and growth projection we gave investors hopefully it will be uh, it'll be a solid number what's the projection you gave investors and the growth path um, we just we just actually um, honestly you know we are very conservative so at the moment our projection don't even include our projections for uh, for fashion so um, it's difficult to just nail down a number. So purely for beauty. But uh, I feel that uh, a tech-enabled company in India, a tech-enabled retailer in India, would continue to see a pretty high percentage growth. So you can just keep building from where we are. 30%, 40% so, CAGR? Yeah, definitely. 50 plus? No, no, not 50 plus CAGR. But uh, definitely, I think this year we are projecting to grow 80%. at 80%. And then it will continue to grow from there. So yeah. Falconi, thank you very much uh, for your time and speaking to Tech at Work. Thank you. I'm happy to be here.